Now we're recording. Okay, so the C star right there in the middle, and once again, I'll draw a little circle there so you know exactly where it's at. It's kind of hard to see sometimes um, with everything mixing in. And so the, the, the C star is, is uh, commonly referred to as a starfish, C star, and we've, always, we've all probably seen a starfish before. And they're not actually fish, they're classified as a group of invertebrates called eco, in, eco, <laughs> eco, Iconoderms. Oof, I probably didn't spell. If there are any biology people out there right now, you can correct me on that. Uh, meaning spiny skin. And so that, that, uh, that, that, not actually a fish. A lot of us call it the starfish, though, not, a, not actually a fish. Next up, we are going to go to. Isla Contoy, Mexico. Well, look at that. What is that? The water surrounding coral reefs contain much more than what can be easily seen. If you were to examine this water with a microscope, you'd discover it's filled with cells and organisms such as phytoplankton, zooplankton, coral larvae, and fish eggs. This plankton can be carried away from the reef on ocean currents and filtered from the water by organisms that use it as a valuable source of energy. So what's up first? We're looking at them right now. What is that? It is a whale shark. Whale shark are actually whale sharks are actually not whales. They're the largest species of fish. Uh, they reach the great size by filtering water for plankton and uh, small fish. Adult whale sharks can reach up to 12 meters, or if you don't know your meter system very well, 12 meters is about the size of a school bus. And so that is a massive, massive shark. Massive, about the size of a school bus. Next up, we have the manta ray. This is kind of cool. There are some places that you can go to uh, and swim with manta rays, which would be really neat to do. Manta rays are a species of fish related to stingrays and sharks. Unlike those predators, which feed on relatively large prey, mantas can survive mainly on plankton. They, eat, they may eat tiny things, but reef mantas can be huge with wingspans of three to four meters. And so if you want to think of three to three to three and a half meters, so if you want to think of three and three and a half meters, we, us, we don't know meters that well very much unless we're scientists. Uh, so meters, a meter is about the size of a, uh, of a, of a yardstick. And, uh, and so if you think of three, of three of those or three and a half of those, that is a massive, massive wingspan on those. I, I, the, the, we, there's a lot of manta rays in, in captivity. And like I said, some places you can swim with them, but uh, they're, that's it's a very large creature. So now we go back to the whale shark and right there hiding underneath the male, male whale shark is uh, called the remora. Uh, remora, also called the sucker fish, have a flat sucking disc on the top of their heads, which they can use to attach themselves to sharks, marine mammals, and ships. They live on parasites on the host's skin and, they, and scraps from the host's meal. So it's pretty interesting. Uh, a lot of times you'll see uh, in the wild, you'll see these small little fish hanging around other things. And so that's what they're doing. They're actually living off of um, what, the, uh, what the larger animal then provides. They also live on, as it said, they live on ships too. Um, they're very, very kind of, they're a little bit similar to barnacles, but, uh, but a little bit different uh, because they are, they are more fish-like than, than what a barnacle would be. Now we're gonna go to the Heron Island on the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, back to the Great Barrier, Barrier Reef again. Didn't mean to draw that line. Back to the Great Barrier Reef. Although it's part of the Great Barrier Reef, the Heron Island Reef looks very different than from Sanders Reef. The spur and groove pattern in the reef here is created by erosion found on windward shores of the islands. The waters around Heron Island uh, support vast biodiversity with over three quarters of the 1,500 fish species and just under three quarters of the coral species found in the Great Barrier Reef as a whole. So there's a lot of different diversity, a lot of different wildlife diversity. So this is one of my favorites here. You can see them already. That is a, a green turtle. 
of the seven existing species of marine turtles, six can be found in the waters of the Great Barrier Reef. Green turtles are the most numerous. This herbivore can reach up to five feet long and weigh as, five, as much as 500 pounds. That is huge, huge. Those turtles are massive. They can be huge. This guy here is just a little baby turtle. And uh, if anybody can think about uh, what, is a, what is a herbivore? A herbivore is something that eats vegetables and only vegetables. So vegetables and plants, these turtles don't eat uh, any sort of uh, any sort of any uh, anything else other than vegetables and plants. Next up, we have a different type of coral, and this is called the plate coral. Look, there's another turtle up there at the top too. Uh, plate coral, unlike the corals that make up the structure of the reef, plate coral are non-colonial. So that means that they don't form in colonies. They're not formed in chunks, um, and they don't buy a buy a. Uh, they're not. Uh, they're not. They don't depend on each other. Uh, they they're completely, completely uh, self-dependent, independent of each other. They don't attach themselves to the seabed. They also they're free floating, so they don't. They don't. They're not attached to the seabed. Their large surfaces area maximize the amount of sunlight that can reach the algae living in their tissue. So these can grow a lot larger because they're a lot larger of a coral um, and they can get more sunlight, they can get that more algae growing and then that algae is what, what feeds the coral as well. Next up, we have another fish species. This is a little tiny guy here. Right there, that little yellow blob that you can kind of see, it's kind of going into the coral. That's called a yellow long-nosed butterfly fish. It's called a butterfly fish because it, it kind of resembles a butterfly fish if we were to look at a larger version of that. And uh, commonly found in saltwater aquariums, these, the yellow long-nosed butterfly fish feeds on small crustaceans. It comes equipped with a snout like a pair of needle nose pliers, perfectly adapted for snipping off the tentacles of tube worms. So these these uh, yellow fish, a yellow long nose fish, like to uh, like to get in that little uh, get in those little nooks and crannies and crevices of the coral and just pick off uh, little crustaceans and pick off those uh, um, those little uh, um, the uh, the little worms that are that are living inside of those as well. Okay, next up we are going to go to the Galapagos Islands in Ecuador. So the Galapagos Islands in Ecuador is very famous. Look at that. We even got a, a picture of, we broke the fourth wall. They broke the fourth wall in this, in this picture. We got a picture of, the, of one of the camera people. Uh, the Galapagos Islands are a group of volcanic islands located off the coast of Ecuador. Geographically isolated from the mainland, they are home to many plant and animal species found nowhere else in the world. And if we study history, which I do, I love history. We know that Charles Darwin has a lot to do with the Galapagos Islands. He did a lot of experiments in the Galapagos Islands. And famously in 1835, he traveled to the Galapagos Islands on board the HMS Beagle. It's a pretty funny name. Anybody has a Beagle? It's a pretty funny name. As a self-funded naturalist, Darwin's observations of wildlife on the islands contributed to his formation of the theory of evolution. So if we were to study the theory of evolution, uh, we have to, uh, Darwin is, is the one that came up with that. And a lot of his work that, that made him come to that conclusion was done on, on the Galapagos Islands. And the reason he chose the Galapagos Island, of course, is because of all the massive amounts of animal species and plant species that are found on these islands. First up, we have right here, look at these guys from swimming around. Being, being, being cute, swimming around. They're probably, a lot of times, sea lions like to swim around and they like to interact with humans. So they probably saw all these camera people, these camera people and scuba divers coming in. So they decided we need, to, we need to swim over there and investigate these people. Galapagos sea islands are a distinct species of sea islands that only breed in these islands. They're, they're nowhere else in the world. They're only in the Galapagos Islands. They are the largest animal species in the Galapagos. Adult weigh, males weigh up to 900 pounds and they can hunt uh, fish in surrounding waters. So you, you can imagine a 900 pound Galapagos seal is, is that's a huge seal. Uh, most people, you know, most humans weigh 
150, 200, 250, 300 pounds maybe. Think about tripling that. I'm, you know, I'm a pretty big guy and uh, you'd have to probably, you'd have to almost triple my weight to get to that, the, the weight of one of those sea lions, huge, massive creatures. Next up, we have the club urchins. So these are pretty interesting. If you look right there in the middle, right there, you can kind of, you can kind of see it. it. Looks like a little spiky thing there, right there in the middle of that circle. As members of the class Ichno, Ichnodia, man, I keep running into that word. I probably should have uh, pronounced that before we started. Sea urchins are related to sand dollars and sea stars. Club urchins have thick protective spines and feed on algae and smaller invertebrates such as sea squirts and sponges. So these little guys like to float around. Um, we've probably seen some sea club urchins, sea urchins before. Uh, they're very popular. If you go to uh, uh, larger aquariums, they, they usually have some sea urchins in there. Next up, we have the surgeon fish. It's the very, not a great picture of the surgeon fish. There's tiny, tiny little white dots all the way out there in the middle. Those are called the surgeon fish. I wish they would have included a larger picture on this, uh, on this one. Sorry about that. We'll go back to the surgeon fish. Surgeon fish, also known as tang, which is funny. If uh, any parents or grandparents or anybody in the room, we can all probably remember tang from the 1980s and 90s. Um, so a little bit different, not a powdery orange drink mix, but it's actually a fish. Uh, it's named after spines located along the base of their tails. The spine is sharp like a surgeon's scalpel and helps defend the surgeon fish from predators. Okay, this one's pretty cool here too. A lot of times you don't really think about uh, what goes on. You always think of all this natural wildlife that goes on in the ocean. And a lot of, uh, there's actually a lot of, a lot of wreckage and a lot of uh, other things that are in the bottom of the ocean that, that we might not think about. It's a ship. Well, it used to be a ship because many marine invertebrates such as corals, sponges, and oysters need hard surfaces on to attach themselves to. Many locations like this around the world where there are sunken stru structures have been the foundation of a coral reef system. The Benwood hasn't sunk. The Benwood, this is USS Benwood. Uh, the Benwood ha uh, wasn't sunk in, in order to provide the foundation for a reef, but artificial reefs aren't uncommon. Their main purpose is to attract and increase fish populations. And so this is a, as our last, uh, our last area that we're going to explore today, this is very important to the, the coral reef system because a lot of the coral reef system is, is um, they're, it's, uh, it's, they're very fragile uh, because they're tiny and they're, they're like filters. If you can think of a filter in, in any system, the filter you have to change every so often. Well, these filters obviously you can't change, and so they're constantly filtering in this bad stuff. And so there's a lot of pollutants in the in in the oceans, and so those those unfortunately those corals are dying because they're just filtering in this too much bad stuff. And so there's a lack of coral. When there's a lack of coral, that means that there's a lack of uh, ecosystem for fish to survive in. And so that lack of ecosystem for fish to survive in, then they're naturally uh, more susceptible to prey, and they're going to die off quicker. So this is why, um, uh, you, you know, shipwrecks and other things that land in the bottom of the ocean, um, a lot of times provide this really nice natural landing space for this, uh, the coral reef, and also for, for fish to survive in. It's like a tree that lands in the middle of a forest. Um, if the tree lands in the middle of the forest and it's not destroying anything, just leave it there because that creates a really nice habitat for forest animals um, and also plants. Um, whereas ships, and uh, as, it said, as, I, as I mentioned, uh, they're actually creating um, uh, fake coral reefs as well or, or fake structures and they, and they land those in the bottom of the ocean so those coral reefs start to grow on that, uh, on that structure. Um, so it's pretty cool um, that they're doing all of this because uh, if they weren't to do all this, there's a good chance that, you know, there, some species of fish and some species of marine life might, might, actually, um, uh, might actually cease to exist.
So first of all, we're going to look at uh, wood decay. And uh, uh, the wood decay, um, uh, aquatic worms and other decomposers feed on parts of a ship that will rot and leave behind steel frames and beams on which coral larvae can attach. The larvae metamorphose into polyps which form an ever-growing colony. So it's kind of cool. There are a lot of things that go to town working on this ship in order to prepare it for that uh, that coral to uh, to 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 fix affix to and and to grow on, um, so uh, it's pretty it's pretty neat. Uh, much like you know, in in on on ground, uh, if something is decaying, there are a lot of things that that benefit off of that as well. So one of the fish types of uh, of that 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 hang out around these these areas are are sergeant majors. They're called. Sergeant Major's set of uh, five distinctive stripes resembling military stripes. That's why it's called the Sergeant Major. The, these common reef dwellers change their overall coloration from white to dark when they take in, uh, when they take cover in caves and crevices. So it's pretty neat. Uh, not a lot of animals can do that, um, but uh, they're, they're almost like chameleons. We always think of chameleons as being able to change the color of their their uh, outer surface that, to, uh, to blend in with the natural environment. These uh, sergeant majors are, are able to do the same thing. And last, we have what is called, let me see this little tiny fish. It's got a little yellow right there. Once that, yeah, there you go. Uh, these are called grunts, or also known as pork fish. Uh, they're named after the grunting sound they make by rubbing their teeth together. Schools of these fish can be seen swimming through the water at night, which is pre pretty interesting. And we, we don't think of fish as making noises, um, but uh, these these grunt fish can actually uh, can actually make noises, which is is pretty interesting. So that is uh, that is the end of today's uh, uh, field trip. I thank you once again for uh, for for going ahead and we won't pause it. We'll just uh, we'll let it rotate. So uh, thanks a lot for coming and in, in, in visiting uh, the great depths of the ocean. Um, if you have any questions, let me know. Also, uh, as we're discussing any questions, I do have uh, the evaluation link uh, in the in the chat box. Uh, please do take that evaluation. It's very short. Um, I just need, I just want to capture the information of uh, who's on this field trip. And uh, also, if you have any suggestions or if you have any comments, um, also there's an area for that. Uh, right below that link is a website that I set up a couple weeks ago with some virtual reality resources and um, and able to, hold on a second, I'll post the, um, I'll post the evaluation again. There you go. You should be able to see that link now. Um, I think depending on when you join the, the yep, there we go. I think depending on when you joined, uh, it might not have showed up. Um, so there's the evaluation again. Um, once again, uh, just uh, make sure you fill that out. It's, it's like five, six questions um, and uh, helps us uh, grow even better. Um, next week, um, not sure where we're going to visit. Uh, it'll be a surprise. I have to go through the the list of expeditions and see which one seems interesting, and uh, and see where we can uh, uh, see where we can go next week. Uh, so, does anybody have any questions? If you do, if you want to put it in the chat box, that's fine. Or if you want to open up your mic, uh, that's also fine. If you're not familiar with Zoom, uh, you can unmute yourself in the bottom left corner of the screen where there's a little microphone. Has anybody visited a coral reef before? Has anybody um, has anybody gone scuba diving in a coral reef? I have not. I think it'd be really cool though. Thank you. I I, I appreciate all the uh, positive feedback. Hopefully, this is uh, um, exciting and, and entertaining and educational at the same time. That's the that's the point of, uh, um, of these these virtual field trips is is to get uh, students out to uh, areas that um, 
that they've never been before and, and there might not be a choice to go to, um, such as last week when we went to the International Space Station, there's a pretty slim chance of ever uh, 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 somebody, just a random person ever being able to get on the International Space Station. So uh, it's pretty neat to go through there and, and check that out. Poor reefs, might be able to get to those. Still take a lot of money though, especially if you took a class field trip. <laughs> okay, I don't see any questions or anything. If you do have any questions, um, I, I, uh, I'll post my, I'll just give you all my email address. If you do have any questions, uh, feel free to email me there. Um, and uh, if you, like I said up the top there, we've got resources and I'll repost that real quick, uh, just in case you can't have, you didn't have access to that in the beginning. Um, do have a lot of resources. Um, those are gonna grow. Uh, also recordings of, of the virtual field trips um, are gonna be posted uh, on that website as well. Okay, I don't see any questions. So thanks a lot for uh, attending and we'll see you next Friday. Have a nice weekend, everybody.